As soon as I arrived in LA, I had my eye on making it in Hollywood. I was brave. I took the acting classes, networked, ugh, scoured for reps, willing to take on someone green while watching the most talented of my peers move on to do great things. One of my best friends is the voice of Del Taco. <laughs> Another gal has the distinct honor of landing the role of prostitute on Black Sales. She so pulled off that corset. They were all doing it right. So it didn't take long for my unruly inner critic to conclude that I was failing. Creeping around in the shadows of my anxiety riddled mind was this person longing to be an artist. I came from a movie and TV family. I was captivated by performance and I daydreamed all the time, escaping into other worlds, even now. I put on headphones and I act out different scenes from movies in my room. For me, it's this freedom of not living with my inner critic for a moment. But I will admit, some of my desire to be in the entertainment industry is about the money <laughs> and the possibility of meeting Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> I grew up in a small suburb in Nashville, a place where being in the arts is not held in high regard. If you weren't in a youth group or rebelled against the status quo, or rebelled against the status quo, you were ostracized. But I had a bit of a rebellious streak. Once I wore bright blue pants <laughs> and I was publicly shamed. <laughs> in school, I dabbled in theater and I played the clarinet, but I never owned the identity of an artist because I didn't want to get made fun of. It wasn't until college that I found a tribe that gave me the permission to express myself creatively. My friends and I made a feature called Ain't It Nowhere, a coming of age story about people growing up in the South. It landed in the Nashville Film Festival and it won the audience award because it was a masterpiece? No, it was because the entire theater was full of just my friends and family. Um, so they gave us five stars. I used the fake valor as momentum to ignore my inner saboteur. By the time I identified as an actor trying to make it in LA, my inner critic became ravenous. It needed to be fed every four hours. For breakfast, something about how rapidly I was aging and how I could really stand to lose some weight because the camera adds 10 pounds. For lunch, it's about how all my friends are faking that they like me and they actually find me rather annoying. Dinner is light. I am watching my figure. Uh, so usually it's how, about how I'm lazy and maybe I could go memorize a monologue and post it online to be discovered by Spielberg and become the next Maria. But someone already did that. So I will just watch another episode of The Simpsons. I got a few day jobs, one at a restaurant and a yoga studio. The thought of making a living on my talent alone was a joke. I never allowed myself to be a starving artist, but I was not above calling out of work for auditions, skipping out of guaranteed money for the mere possibility of getting in front of the camera. While I never lived in my car and I didn't get my phone disconnected, I was hopeless. I was living some kind of artist trope. I really romanticized the struggle and late at night I'd conjure up my pretend world, picturing myself as my favorite characters with whiskey and a cigarette I became Fleabag. <laughs> After four years of auditioning and no callbacks, uh, a miracle happened. I booked a gig for a Facebook ad. I played a chef. <laughs> the role was simple. Um, I just had to make bread in this decked out kitchen. I had a trailer and my own PA. A PA! <laughs> this dude probably graduated with an MFA from Tish and now he's holding a water bottle with a straw in it while I drink it right out of his hands. <laughs> I threw flour up in the air and it landed on this marble countertop. Take after take, I'm kneading dough and winking at the camera. The director said, you're doing a great job. I caught myself in the glass of this oven in this beautiful mansion and I liked what I saw. My inner critic was silenced so fast it was like I had a good type of brain damage. <laughs> this is where it would all take a successful turn, I thought. The offers would roll in and I could prove to myself that I was good enough. 
I got paid a whopping $1,500. And then it was gone. Because they charge you by the hour to live in Los Angeles. Escaping reality wasn't gonna work this time. What do the desperate do? The desperate donate blood plasma. I approached it like any other acting gig. There was a scale of earnings, and like many jobs in Los Angeles, it all depended on your weight. The more you weighed, the better you were for the role. I wanted that max cash out, but once again, my body wasn't good enough. The only thing standing in my way of $145 was what so many Hollywood beauties do for their Oscar. I had to put on pounds. In order to clear the minimum LBs, I stole weights from the yoga studio that I worked at and I stuffed them into my jacket pockets. I stood in a two-hour cattle call with fellow Angelinos, all varying degrees of broke, be it money, dreams, or spirit. Maybe they Googled how to make money fast, and this popped up for them too. A committed actor would have maybe used this as an opportunity to people watch for character study, and all I could think about was not getting caught with the weights in my pants. The phlebotomist called me in. She checked my arm for tracks marks and asked me about my sexual history. In acting, your body is your instrument, and I had given up my body metaphorically, and now literally, for rent, for food, for everything. <laughs> then she stuck a giant needle the size of a straw into my arm and sucked the blood out of my veins, separated the plasma, and then redistributed the blood back into my body. And it hurt like shit. Um, this was not what I had in mind for my big shot. That afternoon, I sneakily returned the weights at the yoga studio, and as far as they knew, each student I checked in didn't know I was recovering from massive blood loss. I greeted the next student, and he lit up when he saw me. Didn't I see you kneading dough? He asked. Embarrassed, I said, oh yeah, donating plasma is a really quick way to make some money, but it's awful. What are you talking about, he said. I saw you kneading dough, motioning with his hands. My God. I thought he saw me kneading dough. Not kneading dough. He recognized me from the Facebook commercial, but my brain convinced me it was much more probable that this man had seen me on Victory Boulevard at 2.50 p.m., saw me at the plasma donation center, understood my financial standing, and felt the need to comment on it. <laughs> what were the odds? No one even saw that commercial. It wasn't the thing that you write home about. It was like this fleeting ad you see on your timeline between Aunt Robin's rant about some, seeing some dude's butt crack at Costco <laughs> and pictures of your high school bully's new baby. I couldn't believe anyone would see me, less, much less congratulate me. My imposter syndrome kicked in, and the inner critic reappeared. Apparently, it thrived on blood loss. <laughs> I cried the whole walk home from the yoga studio. I wanted something that clearly didn't want me back. I wasn't learning transferable skills, not that I knew what I could even transfer to. I wasn't accomplishing any life milestones or climbing any professional rungs. I was frozen in a lack of development to serve a calling or a dream, and it wasn't working. When I feel particularly self-loathing, I watch YouTube interviews of famous actors, and there's a common question that's asked. Beyond acting, what would you do if you could do anything? And they always always say that they're not good at anything else. And I had no idea what I was good at, and evidence was building that I couldn't even act. I flirted with success. I had the half a million dollar commercial set and a brush encounter with a fan. But <laughs> at this point, getting the call back for a flea bag reboot was about equivalent to climbing Everest. My pity party would have to wait. I still needed to make ends meet. With my standards at an all-time low, I took a job bartending at a pro-life fundraiser at a mega mansion in Santa Monica. Cement walls and angular, futuristic decor chilled me to the bone. No warmth or smiles had lingered in this house for very long. 
the upstairs downstairs kind of disrespect projected onto the entire staff was almost comical. The guest list included people that I could only describe as goblins. <laughs> Rude, evil people wielding way too much money and power and influence. With every seven up I cracked, I felt more distance from myself. Catering to this dystopian group of rich people made me feel like a traitor. When the pandemic hit, my random service jobs came to an end. I retreated back home to Tennessee, and it was temporary to wait out quarantine and have my mommy take care of me for a little bit. <laughs> I took the infinite free time and space as an opportunity to reevaluate and figure out what my world was gonna look like when I returned to LA. I didn't take up knitting, and I didn't learn another language. Instead, I watched the news, a lot. People much smarter than me have surmised that with our attention on the news, Americans were more enraged and engaged than ever before. I watched millions mobilize in defense of ideals I believed in. It made acting pursuits seem so shallow. The arts are incredibly important, but the bravery and action of people I saw on TV, unscripted and raw, put it all in a new perspective. I wanted in. So I made a list of employers to pursue, and the highest on the list was Planned Parenthood. Yeah. With the help of my customer service experience, I got a job at the reception desk. Then I worked my way up to diversity and inclusion committees. And then one fine day, I was given the opportunity to present a bill to lawmakers that would democratize telemedicine in reproductive health clinics. I was performing, <laughs> presenting my case to a room full of people. I had their attention. I was affecting an outcome. I was bit by the lobbying bug. <laughs> As a distributed organizer for social justice campaigns and a lobbyist for reproductive rights, I had dipped my toe into politics and I liked it. I traded in humiliating audition rooms and weights in my pockets for bodily autonomy. I felt more content and whole than I had in years. And my body was absolutely brimming with plasma. I have never booked another acting gig. I do have an IMDb page, but I don't pay for the subscription, so it's kind of like this little hidden ghost picture with a like couple credits. The aspirations of being a thriving, working actor that once bright burned really bright diminished to a flicker. I demanded a bit too much from my mind and body for something that just wasn't in the cards for me. The entertainment industry isn't exactly known for its tenderness or compassion. Don't get me wrong, DC is just Hollywood for ugly people. So <laughs> the path could be full of pitfalls and bad characters. But I found my voice. Occasionally though, I'll watch an excellent performance and get really jealous. The dream still haunts me and it takes me by surprise that I would still want something that feels really damaging. But if there is a slim chance of starring alongside Phoebe Waller-Bridge, her people can get in touch and uh, we'll do lunch. <laughs> Emily Blocker, Emily Blocker everyone.